Hello cell biology fans. I know I said I'd get this to you yesterday. I'm hoping to get it to you today. Uh, I am crazy running around, but I'm thinking we can make some progress here. So this is about microscopy, and I told you that seeing is believing, and I hope that by giving you this lecture, it gives you a better understanding of how we use microscopes, what kind of microscopes we use, and what they're, what they're really good at, and what their limitations are. And all of this will be included on exams, so please take notes, and as I said, I would give you a quiz, so be watching for that on Moodle. Let's get going. Okay, so this video was taken in the 50s, and I just want to play it. And what it shows is a neutrophil, which is a white blood cell and it's been plated onto a glass slide. The cells that are sort of kind of crazy shaped that are sitting there are red blood cells and the little black dots that this neutrophil is chasing is actually Staph aureus, it's a bacteria. And what I want you to get from this is that by watching the activity of cells it gives us a lot of information. If I were to play that again, right? The cells that are static are sitting there. They don't have the ability to move. The bacteria are moving, but they're not moving really in anything other than random Brownian motion. Um, but the but the white blood cell, the neutrophil, actually is changing directions as it needs to to follow a gradient that's being left by the bacteria as it moves through the media. So being able to see what's going on really makes a huge difference in cell biology. So where did this all begin? Microscopy really began back a long time ago and the first person who really made an effort to to talk about this was uh, Hook. And Hook looked at, there's a classic picture where he has uh, an image of cork, and cork is the bark from a tree. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Hook, and then I'm going to talk about Schleiden and Schwann, and they came up with the cell theory based on their ability to look at cells using microscopy. This is the image I was referring to. So Robert Hooke in the 1600s was able to use a very primitive microscope to look at slices of cork. And what he noticed in this compound microscope, a compound microscope means that it's using multiple lenses, um, was that he could see these empty spaces surrounded by walls. And What's interesting about this is he gave the name cella, which means storage, sort of like a cellar, stores items. And if you think about that, what we're really seeing in these images is the cell wall material that lasts for long, long, long periods of time. Cell walls are made up of, of cellulose and those are made of beta-1,4 glycosidic linkages as compared to any of the other kinds of materials that would be internal within a cell, within a membrane. So you can't see the membrane, the cells are gone, they're, everything is long gone, the only thing that remains are these cell walls. So this is something very specific to plant cells. We, we can't actually see ancient cells that aren't plant cells because they're they're gone. They're actually nothing there to, that remains. But Hook was the first one to notice this, and as I said, he used a very simplified microscope that had a couple of lenses. The next guys were Schleiden and Schwann. Okay, that's a mouthful. Uh, you might know Schwann from Schwann cells, which are part of the uh, brain. So Schwann cells are actually made up of, uh, they're almost macrophage that are part of your brain. And so Schwann looked at animal cells and Schleiden was looking at plant cells and they actually, they talked to one another. But Schwann was a, a bit of a jerk and he went ahead and publishing the cell theory that they had been discussing without actually telling Schleiden. But we now know that Schleiden and Schwann both came up with the, the theory, the cell theory, which is one of the founding uh, theories of biology along with the theory of evolution by Darwin and Wallace. So the things that I'd like you to know here, right, the cell is, right, the smallest structure, the smallest living unit of life, 
And what's important about that is, is everything can be contained within a cell. Um, cells, it's interesting, you know, cells can either be, you know, a distinct entity, so they can either be all on their own, or they can be part of a more complex multicellular organism, such as humans or animals. Um, and so they have this dual existence as being building blocks, or also they can be the whole organism itself. One of the original tenets, all right, one of the original postulates of the cell theory was that cells form by spontaneous generation. And the reason for that is multiple, all right? These guys were looking and making observations, and from those observations of, of cells, they were then making hypotheses that they tested over and over and over again, and from that they came up with the cell theory. Uh, this, unfortunately, is one of the postulates, the original postulates, that is incorrect. The reason that they thought that cells arose by spontaneous generation is something that you can see, right, in your in your refrigerator, right? This might be in your refrigerator. Uh, back in the day, right, these guys had grain storages, might have been in something that looked like a silo, and, right, they didn't put any mice in those silos. They put grain in there, and all of a sudden they had a bunch of mice. They didn't know where the mice came from. In the the concept of bread and bread mold, right, they they had bread and it was sitting out, and then all of a sudden it had something growing on top of it. You might see this in your bathtub, where all of a sudden you see some red material in the bathtub, and that's a bacteria called uh, serratia. Serratia. It's really not a terrible bacteria, but that red stuff growing in your bacteria, it's not good for you, and you really do want to clean your bathtubs to get rid of it. So all of these sorts of observations led to the concept that, hey, things arise by spontaneous generation. We now know that not to be true. It's obvious that mice mice could smell the, the grain and come in and eat. And we know that bread mold comes from where? Comes from the air. Things that are in the air have fungus on them, and when they land on the, the bread, it'll grow over time. And it's all a matter of do you eat it before you can see it? Because it's there no matter what. So if you eat it before you see it, usually you don't get sick. Once you can see it, it, it often has uh, materials in the mold that can make you sick, so we usually throw it away. Not the French. The French eat everything. They like mold, right? Moldy cheese is even better than non-moldy cheese. So the revised cell theory, right, still had all cells are li uh, all living things are made up of cells. So that means the cell is the structural and functional unit of all living things. Cells come from pre-existing cells. That was the big change that occurred from spontaneous generation. We know that cells have to contain the hereditary information, which is passed from cell to cell. Um, cells are basically the same chemical composition. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a bacteria, a uh, fungus, a uh, diatome, a uh, mammalian cell, a human cell. We're all made up of the same thing. Hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. Those atoms are put into the same building blocks. They're made into carbohydrates, nucleic acids, lipids, and amino acids. Those are made into complex carbohydrates, into uh, phospholipid membranes, into uh, DNA and RNA and into complex proteins and so we are no different than anybody else and finally the last thing is all right all cells have energy flow meaning that they do metabolism all right we have to uh, convert energy from one form to another and we use that energy to live and grow and replicate without energy we can't grow and replicate there would be no life so this lecture is about microscopy. I think maybe we should look at a microscope and look at the different places on the microscope, what's important. So everybody should know that the eyepiece, right, is up here. And in the eyepiece, there is actually a lens. So what this is pointing to here is a lens. And that lens has some ability to magnify. All right, uh, usually we have a second uh, lens and that lens is called the objective. 
and the objective is one of these. So usually you choose, right? You choose 10x, 40x, 60x, or 100x. All right. And that x gets multiplied with the x up here, and that gives you a total uh, amplification factor. All right, so you know where the objective is, you know where the eyepiece is, all right? What else is there? So the specimen, this is the specimen, right? A slide will sit here on the stage, and light is sent through, all right, a condenser. So actually, this is the condenser, I think, that's being shown. Uh, the light is underneath here in the housing. So the light is sent through a condenser. The condenser causes the light to be bent so that it's concentrated and it gets sent through the specimen and once it goes through a specimen it gets diffracted based on what it hits in the specimen. Alright, so those are the sorts of things that I and and right so then we have to collect that light here and that light is sent through the microscope to its final place where you look at it with your eyeball. So ultimately, really, what you're looking at when you look at a specimen is light. So light is hitting your eye. And that light has information based on what it's hit and how it's been diffracted and what happens to the light after it hits that specimen. Two things about microscopy, magnification and resolution. And I think this is all going to be clear to you guys because you all are into, you know, taking selfies on your on your cell phones. And magnification is something that we all understand. If you have an image and you just blow it up, all right, it it will get bigger and bigger and bigger, but you might lose resolution, and that's dependent upon the number for us, right, the number of pixels per whatever pixels per square inch. Right. The more pixels you have per square inch, the better your image, which means that you can blow it up really big and it'll still have resolution. All right. So magnification is really dependent upon the original image and how you took the, the image. Resolution is a really interesting concept. So the minimal distance between two objects. So if I have two objects down here, okay, there's one object and here's a second object. Right, the resolution is the minimal distance between two objects that allow each object to be viewed as separate from the other. As I've drawn this here, I think you all can see that there is a space between these two objects. If I blow this up, okay, that space becomes more, actually we're losing resolution because there's not very good resolution on this screen but you can see very clearly that there's space and that space if I could draw very finely right I could actually draw these two lines closer to one another without them touching okay so resolution I, I was interrupted there resolution uh, is really if you can see right what is the minimum distance between these two objects that you can still see and so resolution is really really good if the distance is tiny, 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 if it requires you to have two objects one meter apart to tell that they're well, they're not the same, you have very, 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 very bad resolution. If it's point zero 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 one meters, right? That's going to be way better. All right, so that's resolution. You're going to see, all right as we go through this, that resolution is dependent upon the wavelengths of light that is shown at the same. Here is an example of magnification, right? The picture, this picture was never good, but at small, if you look at it small, small is okay when you make it bigger, all right? Because it wasn't a very high resolution to start with, it starts to get really pixelated and right, I mean that's just not that's not good so you can't just blow up pictures ad nauseum unless they're taken at a very high resolution okay you lose the the sort of beauty of the picture so magnification has its real limitations 
And the way we get total magnification on a microscope, as I said before, is by taking the objective and multiplying it by the eyepiece. So in this case, you have a 4x objective with a 10x eyepiece. It gives you a total magnification of 40x. Okay, 40x isn't very much, right? Uh, almost everything I look at has to be 100x, right? And if you only have a 10x objective, you're, you really can't see all that well, but you can get a all right, a 40x objective with a 100x uh, eyepiece. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can get a 40x. I don't want a 40x. I want a 100x. I want a 100x objective with a 10x eyepiece, and that gives me a magnification of 1,000x. That's what I have to look at to see cells, at least at the resolution that I can tell what's going on inside of a cell. Notice the eyepiece doesn't change. Usually the eyepiece has a limited uh, magnification of 10x, and really the only thing that can change is the objective. All right, so this is math, and math is bad. Uh, but if you look at the formula for resolution, okay, here is the formula for resolution. Resolution is equal to, okay, a constant and n sine theta. So n is going to be constant for any given microscope, sine theta. So theta, half the angular width of the cone of rays collected by the objective lens from a typical, uh, for any given microscope, all right, you can forget all of this, all right, and that leaves lambda. Resolution, and we say that resolution is proportional, at least, to lambda. Lambda is wavelength. Because wavelength is the thing that we can change most easily on microscopes. Okay, All this other stuff, if you want to learn it, great. If you don't want to learn it, great. Uh, refractive index, blah, blah, blah. All right. What I'd like you to know is that the resolution is going to be dependent on the wavelength, and by changing the wavelength, we can get better and better and better resolution. All right. So how does that work? It's functional. All right. And so I drew these in up here. All right. So we just get rid of this. We get rid of this altogether, and wavelength. All right. Is going to give us resolution. Remember, a very low number for resolution. All right. Low number. That's good as far as, look, we can see that still. So what does that mean? The lower the wavelength, the better the resolution. Okay, up here, there's two things shown. We have frequency. Frequency is one part of wavelength and wavelength. All right. Notice frequency, high frequency, low frequency. Low fre what is frequency? Okay, here's a wave. That's one wave, okay. This is another wave. The frequency of this wave is higher than the frequency of this wave. There's more of them per unit area. So if you have a high frequency, high frequency, high, sorry, high frequency, that means that you have a low number, the wavelength is less. Ugh, what am I talking about? What is it that I'm talking about? All right, if you look at this, we are talking about wavelength and resolution, and here are the wavelengths. So we're talking from here to here, visible light, because that's really what we end up using most often. All right, there are, we can talk about X-rays and gamma rays and cosmic rays. All right, so a long wavelength. All right, red. Red is a long wavelength compared to blue. The blue wavelength will give us greater resolution because it's right, it's a smaller number. All right.
Let's just talk about light. Light, right, is a photon. A photon is a packet of energy. Really, what we're talking about, we're sending a packet of energy and it moves in a wave. All right? And a wavelength is from, right, one wave to the next wave. So this, from here to here, is a wavelength. So that's a wavelength, and if I have another wave, right, let's say I have a blue wave, okay, I could do it twice as fast. Can I do this? All right, so the wavelength for this one is from here to here. All right, so that wave, the blue wave, all right, has a wavelength that is one half the wavelength of the red wave. All right, if we go back one slide, this again, okay, if we Put this up to the side, and I say small wavelength. Okay, there's a small wavelength. And if this is proportional to resolution, right, small is going to give us a greater resolution, meaning we can see better. We can distinguish two objects more easily as being separate or not than a large wavelength. Large wavelength is lower resolution. Everybody should know Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Which one has the highest wavelength? So large wavelength, small wavelength. Okay, and how does wavelength relate to uh, frequency, right? <sighs> Smaller waves, Smaller waves have higher frequency. More, more energy is involved in that. Okay. What we're really talking about is looking at how this light hits a sample. And as it hits a sample, how does that wave... Okay, here's a wave. All right, let me do it red. Here's a wave. And when it hits a sample, right, what happens to that wave? It gets diffracted. And so it might become faster, it might become even slower, and that makes a difference because ultimately that wavelength is going to hit your eye. If you're confused, you should be, all right? This is confusing. This is physics. Physics is hard. Okay. What you should know at this here's the bottom line. Magnification is really limited. Okay, Magnification is dependent really on the lenses. We can only make lenses so large to do magnification. All right, so very limited, but resolution is dependent on wavelength. We can change the wavelength of light, right? So we're talking about shining a light at a specimen and collecting the light. And that collection of light over here on your eyeball, right? Here's your eyeball. That collection of light is what we see. So by changing wavelength, we can change resolution. Good? All right, there are four types of light, just plain old light microscopy. This is shining a light at a sample and collecting that light. The four are called bright field, Phase contrast, DIC, which is digital inter interference contrast, and dark field. And this is literally playing with wavelengths. That's all this is. 
you have most definitely seen Brightfield. You have probably seen Phase Contrast. If you work in a lab, you may have seen DIC. Very few people have seen Darkfield. Darkfield is a very special circumstance that I've never seen, although I think it would be very cool to see this. And I hope, just by looking at this, these four images, right, four images of the same cell, by using different mechanisms of collecting light, what can happen? All right, can you see more or less? detail using bright field or phase contrast. So bright field really is just collecting all the wavelengths of light as they are scattered and it, it gives you an image but the image right doesn't have a whole lot of uh, differences from from one place in the cell to another. Phase contrast they've used a little trick and it actually is what it what it means it gives more contrast to the image so there's darker places and lighter places and our eyes are really good at seeing darker and lighter and how do you see darker and how do you see lighter so darker and lighter are all about how many wavelengths are there darker is less wavelengths lighter is more wavelengths and that's a trick that you can do in the microscope another one is using digital interference and this is using a digital way of capturing the light and digital actually gives you this is a little bit of a 3D image I don't know if you can see it but it, it, it's like you can see things that seem to be popped up compared to the background and things that are sunken in so I would say right here this is sunken in and this is sunken in another name is Namarsky because that's the guy who found this type of microscopy he figured it out um, but it gives you a little bit more of a 3D image and dark field really is basically taking the negative of the image and, and I'll explain that by itself in one second. So in order of you know good, they're all good, they all tell you something different. Um, in general, all right, people can purchase a phase contrast microscope without much problem. DIC is more costly so less people have them. Uh, like I said, nobody nobody does this. So dark field is for very specialized circumstances. Uh, and the cheapest, right? Very cheap. So this is high prices. This is the cheapest. So this is what you've seen most often. Okay. This is all about light. And so light, light is a wave. And that wave, right? So they're showing you in this picture, okay? Here are two waves. And they, they're in phase. When we say they're in phase, it means that their ups are, are together and their downs are together. All right, two waves out of phase. This is two different waves, one and two. All right, so two is like this. It would have been nicer. Okay, and these two different waves, all right, they're basically going to right, cancel one another out because when you have an up here, okay, you have an up, you have a down. And so what ends up happening is you have very little left over of waves. So these waves are additive and they can cancel one another out. When two waves are in phase, all right, the amplitude of the wave, amplitude, is increased. Amplitude, right, is how much you actually see. So this is going to be brighter. This is going to be dim. And how do we get waves out of phase and in phase? When they hit a sample, Right? You're going to shine a light through a sample. The waves are going to hit different parts of the cell, and they're going to get diffracted. And now you're collecting those waves. Some of them are going to be additive. Some of them are going to be subtractive. Some in phase, some out of phase. And you get bright and dark spots. And literally, that's what you're seeing, bright and dark spots. We can do things, right, to a sample, okay? You don't have to stain a sample. You can just have an unstained sample. You can have live cells. You can put live cells on a microscope, shine light, right? so the light's coming from here. The light is sent by, in a particular wavelength through the sample and, right, right next to each other, okay? If this is a cell, this wavelength here has no diffraction. This wavelength is diffracted. And so what you see when you look at this right next to each other is you might see the edge of a cell because here the light was really bright 
but here the light became somewhat dim. And that's just based on these wavelengths. So we can manipulate cells, right? We can manipulate them by staining cells. Staining cells doesn't necessarily kill cells. You can stain cells and uh, look to see what they look like under the microscope. There are actually stains that probably you've used. So tripan blue. Tripan blue. I should have drawn that in blue. We call tripan blue a vital dye. So this is actually blue. It's a vital dye. It means only dead cells. So dead cells take up the tripan blue. So if you see a really dark cell, it's dead. All right. The rest of the cells are something we call electron lucent. All right. So electron lucent. Lucent. What does lucent mean? Electro Electron. I don't know if it's actually got an N. Lucent. Lucent is bright. So you see bright spots. So you see a spot, but around it you see some sort of darkness, and that's inside of a cell that could say, oh, there's the nucleus. So lucent, lucent, the lines are what are electron, electro dense. Dense is dark, lucent is light. All right, I told you phase contrast, right? Phase contrast changes the phases of waves, but DIC, Computer Assisted Differential Interference Contrast. Okay, what is that? Differential Interference Contrast. It creates more contrast, just like the phase uh, contrast will, so that you can see things better. Here is a image which is the difference again between bright field using all the light and phase contrast. So phase contrast all right, takes a microscope and it collects light but it has a ring. And so all of the light that shines through this ring, mm, let me make this bigger, okay so this is going to be phase contrast. All of the light that's coming up through a sample and it goes through here all right, it's going to be whatever diffraction, right? So we're talking about wavelengths. So they're coming out of here and they're diffracted and they're collected as is. All of the wavelengths of light that hit this part of the ring off of the sample, they're going to add a half of a wave, a quarter of a wavelength. So what I'm saying is, here's, all right, here's a wave. If this particular wave is captured in the ring, we're going to add a quarter of a wave. What's a quarter of a wave, right? So this is a quarter of a wave. One quarter, one, two, three, four. So they actually, this ring takes that original wave and adds a quarter of a wave to it. And what that's going to do, oh, excuse me, it's lunchtime, is give more contrast to a wave that was right on the edge here compared to this wave. All right. And so it increases the contrast of light that's coming through the sample. And literally that shows up here in this image. You can see here, like let's take this cell over here you can barely see it. I mean you can see it. It's there. It's definitely there. But it's made some parts of it darker and it's actually made the edge right here lighter. Take a look at more of these. You can see, right, this ends up really light here. These areas in the middle have ended up darker so it's created more contrasts. This is what a phase contrast microscope does. You can see more. I like both of them because they both give you information. I think you can see more sometimes, like in this cell. You can see more internal material in the bright field compared to the phase contrast. Okay, this is a better picture of DIC. I hope you can see this, that this really does look like you have some three-dimensional structure here you can really see the internal organelles 
of this digital interference contrast image. It allows for some shadowing, and this is just done with a, with a microscope that has a computer associated with it. All of these, all four of these light microscopy methods can be used without any stains, so the cells can be alive. You don't have to fix the cells in any way. They can be moving. Um, and so these are really nice to look at cells directly. I like dark field. Okay, I like to talk about dark field anyway, because I don't know anybody that hasn't walked into a spider web. Okay? And the reason that you walk into a spider web is because a spider web, okay, so this image is showing dark field. The dark field that's shown here, well, this is not really a dark field microscope, but what we're doing is it's all about where is the light coming from. In the picture on the left, here on the, this picture, the light is coming from behind, right, outside. So we're on the inside of the glass, the light is coming basically out of the, the iPad at you, and you can't see the spider web at all. Now, a completely different situation occurs on the right-hand side. Here on the right-hand side, what happens is the majority of the light is coming from the side. And so when the light hits at a side angle, all right, you can collect the light that bounces back at an angle. And that is showing you that we can now see the spider web. This is the same thing as when you sort of go off to the side and say, hey, is there a spider web in that, you know, if you're walking through some bushes or whatever. So dark field, I don't really know what the applications for it are, but it's just something you should know. Draw for you a spider web, like I'm really going to be good at that, right? Some spider webs are beautiful, right? And the spiders in them are cool, right? They make beautiful structures. And so the reason we walk into a spider web is because light is usually shining, right? But the light shines from behind it and it's coming at your eyeball. So if my eyeball's here, oh, well, that's a bad eyeball. Okay. If I make my eyeball here, here's my eyeball. Okay, I need brown. Where is brown? How do I get brown? I want brown. Ooh. I don't even see brown. Brown is here. Okay. Here's my big brown eyeball. Ooh, that's a nasty looking color brown. But as the light hits these filaments, right? The light is behind here and it hits these filaments, but these filaments are so tiny, all right? We actually don't really see the spider web. Have you ever noticed that? You can see a spider web if it has water on it, right? So if there's water dripping off of it. Or sometimes if you stand at the side, what happens is the light hits it and it bounces, right? It might bounce off and you can see it better from the side. But there's so much light coming from behind that your eyeball can't see it and you walk right into it and then you have a big spider web on your head and you're freaking out and you're just thinking about it drives me crazy. So that's what this is that that picture once again, right? So it's all about if you hit the light on the side and it comes at your eye, it's a very different experience than having all the light coming from behind and you're just your your light, the light that hits your eye, you can't see anything because there's so much light involved. All right, moving on. Let's talk about fixing and staining cells and how we do sectioning when we have a piece of tissue. So fixing and staining. So if I say fixing, fixing means you are killing the cells. All right, that means the cells have to be put down on something. Usually they're put on a slide, so you have a bunch of cells here. And we usually do something to fix them to the slide. And there's different ways you can do this. You can use formaldehyde or glutaraldehyde. Okay, these these chemicals, all right, it's really interesting how they work. They cross-link free amino groups. Hmm, amino groups. Where have we heard of amino groups? Amino acids, right? Amino acids, all right, every single amino acid starts with a free amino group. All right, you all know how to do this. 
this is the R group here. So every single amino acid has a free amino group, but when they're linked together, right, we have NCC, 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 etc. Okay, you have a free amino group at the end terminus. Where else might you find a free amino group? Which amino acid had a free amino group? Okay, if you don't know, you should know it's lysine. All right, lysine is CH2 four times NH3 plus. And so these free amino groups can be fixed, and what I'm saying is it's basically gluing these cells down on that slide. All right, so fixing, you're killing, and you're holding in place. Staining. Staining is another whole issue. Holding. Oopsie, what am I doing? I lost what I was doing. Holding in place is fixing. Staining. Let's, so staining, you can stain with different stains, and different stains have different features. So some stains may be specific for charge. Okay, so let's say they bind to something that's charged. You can have a stain, like I said already, uh, tripan blue. It only binds to, it only is taken up by dead cells. Some of the stains that you probably heard of are H and E. H and E. So hematoxylin and eosin. Uh, there are other stains that you've probably seen. Basically what we're talking about is when you stain a cell, you're going to stain for per certain organelles, and now when the light tries to go through, it may not be able to go through, or it's going to be diffracted at a different pattern. So this staining allows for more contrast. Ultimately, what are you looking at, no matter when you look at these guys, what are you looking at? You're looking at light, and you're looking at how much light is being detected on the other side of the sample. This is a typical H&E stain, hematoxylin, so stains for red, and hematoxylin binds negatively charged molecules. What's the most negatively charged molecule? Actually, it's not the most. How about highly? I'm going to tell you what is one of the most later. Okay, highly negatively charged is DNA because of the negative groups on the phosphates. So red over here, each red circle that you see is a nucleus. Right, so this is a nucleus, this is a nucleus, this is a nucleus, 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 nucleus. And each one of these guys is a cell. Following the staining with the hematoxylin, uh, there's a counter stain with eosin. That's the E part of H and E. All right. Whoops. Sorry about that. The counter staining, right, of H and E, leads there to be some very dark purple color and some lighter red. And basically, all of the red is some sort of acidic. Right, compartment, and this is this is the staining that most people see in hospitals when they stain tissue samples for for uh, pathological uh, analysis. Um, other stains, other chemical stains, are going to bind to things based on either charged amino acids or ionic interactions, and you can get even some proteins binding to proteins that allow for staining of cells. Another totally different way of staining, okay, is fluorescent staining. And fluorescent staining, I will never get through this lecture if the door doesn't stop knocking. Okay, so fluorescent staining using antibodies. Antibodies, right, are part of our immune system, and the beauty of antibody, mo excuse me again, antibody molecules is that they're highly, highly, highly specific. An antibody is made up of two heavy chains and two light chains. So it's got quaternary structure, it has disulfide linkages between 
the chains and intra-chain disulfides. And it has two regions, okay, basically two arms that are the antibody binding sites. So this is specific for whatever it is that that antibody binds to. So whatever the ligand is, that's what it binds to. Now, the other region down here is not variable at all. It's actually called the FC for the crystallizable fragment. And if you want to think of it in another way, think constant region. Because the FC part does not change much. And so we use these antibodies. You can purchase antibodies, you can make antibodies, and what they're showing you on this particular slide here is that down on the left-hand side, if you look at the antigen A, so some antigen A, this could be a protein, it could be a glycoprotein, um, usually they're proteins of some sort, but you can make antibodies to some sugars. That particular antigen is recognized by the F, the, I'm sorry, the antibody regions on this antibody. And this is a terrible picture, okay? This is not the way it's recognized. It really should be drawn that you have the antigen here, and it is going to get recognized, okay, so I need green. It gets recognized by the regions at the end of the arms, okay? Now, once you have that antibody bound, okay, here, we can do some crazy things. What we can do is we can then, right, so the first antibody is the one that recognizes the antigen. The primary antibody recognizes the antigen. We can add a secondary antibody, and we can actually couple that to something that's fluorescent. I'm going to talk about fluorescent in a minute. That means it's, it's going to be able to be visualized. And what you see here is a little bit wrong as well. These secondary antibodies bind only to the FC region of the antibody. They don't bind to the arms at all. All right, let me give you an example. New slide. Let's say you have an antigen. An antigen like herb B2. Okay, so herb B2, do you remember what that was? Herb B2. That was the receptor for epidermal growth factor. So it's on the surface of a cell, it dimerizes, and it's a receptor on the surface of a cell. That particular right, protein complex can be recognized by an antibody. So you have something, and we call it an anti herb. B2. But that antibody had to have been made in something. So oftentimes we use a rabbit. So it's rabbit anti herb B2. And so that means it was made in rabbit. And often you need to tell us what it was made against. It was made against human herb B2. So that if I use this particular rabbit anti herb B2 antibody, right, it's only going to recognize human herb B2. So over here, let's just say that this is a human cell expressing herb B2, human herb B2, so designated human. And so we'll put a little H here. And this antibody, okay, binds specifically to this receptor. And it might bind to multiple places on the receptor, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But so you get antibodies binding to the receptor. Well, we still can't see these antibodies because there's nothing on them. We could tag these particular, so these primary antibodies, so here the primary antibody. We could tag them with a fluorophore. Let's say we stuck on there something that fluoresces blue. You can do that. It's really expensive, okay? Really expensive to do that. And it's really not expensive to do it the second way. So you can label primary antibodies, but think too expensive. All right. Let's say we take off those, okay? Take off all that expensive shit, all right? But we still have 
have the antibodies. What we can do is we can come back with a secondary antibody. I'm going to draw it in purple. All right, so secondary. Secondary, I can't spell. And what we have to do is we have to specifically have an antibody that recognizes the FC region from rabbit, because these are rabbit antibodies. So we need an anti-rabbit FC. And, right, that can be made in a whole bunch of things. Often we use goats. Okay. Usually it's a large animal for this secondary antibody, because you can make lots and lots of antibody. And then we're going to also take this secondary antibody and we're going to link it to some fluorophore. A fluorophore. What's a fluorophore? I can't even spell fluorophore. It's a molecule that fluoresces, so it's going to give off energy, light. And I'll tell you about what the names of the fluorophores in a minute. So now, if we have a secondary antibody that recognizes this, right, you can actually get a lot of antibodies binding. So you can have lots and lots and lots. Okay, can you catch on? There's lots of antibodies. Secondary antibodies do two things. It actually amplifies the signal cheaply while it's still recognizing, right, it's specifically recognizing the FC that we put in on the primary antibody. All of this does, all this, this does is allow us to see a cell by fluorescence. Fluorescence is another whole physics thing that you need to understand. Okay, what is fluorescence? Fluorescence is when a molecule absorbs energy. It absorbs a wavelength of light and it gives off some energy at a lower wavelength. Lower wavelength of energy is longer. All right, here's an example. Let's say we have a molecule called FITSI. F-I-T-C, which is fluorescein isothiocyanate. Everybody calls it FITSI because nobody wants to say fluorescein isothiocyanate. It can absorb light at a particular wavelength. So here, between this wavelength and this wavelength, it can absorb energy. And what it does is it sends its electrons to a higher energy state, and as those electrons go back down to their regular state, there's an emission spectrum. So light is given off, and you can see here that the wavelength of light is always longer. Longer means what? Lower energy. Longer means longer wavelength. So Roy G. Biv is in, in order from low to longer wavelength. So Fitzy is a molecule that we use all the time in the lab. We shine a, a light at it and it absorbs some energy, but after it absorbs, it goes back to its regular uh, energy state and it emits that energy as this fluorescent light. So wherever this occurs, we can see that fluorophore. So do you understand excitation and emission? This process of using fluorophores allows us to do a lot of intracellular imaging. We can see all sorts of things now inside of cells that we couldn't see before. But it's not just the use of fluorophores, it's also now how we have to manage all the light that we're putting in and all the light that we're actually seeing or detecting. And one of the things you're going to begin to understand is that if you collect all of the light out of a specimen, okay, I'm back again. If we collect all of the light that is given off of a specimen, what you get is what you see in panel A here. And what's happened is that there's so much light being put in that the fluorescence that comes out, it's coming out at different levels, right? So 
you try to have a flat sample, but samples are not always flat. As you can tell from the right here, there's some, some depth to this sample. And so when light comes out of the sample and it's at multiple depths, all right, just imagine what happens to that light. It, they all are going to interfere with each other. And now, right, these are, these are wavelengths of light, and you have massive interference going on. Right? I'm not even drawing waves anymore, but there's massive interference, and you get this fuzzy image. And so there's two things that you can do. You can reject some of the out-of-phase light. So what it means is we're only going to collect light from a small portion of this sample. And so we're that's called optical sectioning. So through optics, we can only collect a little bit of that light that comes out and that makes the image way better. Or we can do it a trick with uh, computers once again. And in this case, all right, it's called image deconvolution. So they actually, hold on. In image deconvolution, they have taken all of the wavelengths of light and somehow through an algorithm in the computer, they are able to line them up such that you don't get as much interference. Hold on. Okay, hopefully I can get to the end of this slide now. All right, we're at the point now where through the process of optical sectioning or through image deconvolution, all of the light is now um, organized in such a way that you get a clear image. And that's what we need, right? We need these clear images to see what's going on, to see three-dimensional structures, to see the intracellular features of a cell. So there's another kind of microscopy. So I've talked so far about light microscopy. Now I'm going to talk about uh, confocal microscopy. And confocal microscopy is a type of fluorescence microscopy. And actually, you don't have to use fluorescence, but almost all uh, confocal microscopy is using some sort of fluorescence. All microscopy is going to use light, all right, and that light is going to be uh, shown onto a sample. And in confocal microscopy, the beauty of this is that we can pinpoint the light at a particular depth of the sample. Let me draw down here on the bottom. Here's a cell, here's a slide and we have a cell that's sitting on that slide. Okay? And the cell is not flat. None, cells are not flat. It turns out cells are not flat. And so the cell might sit here and you might have the nucleus here, but there are organelles elsewhere in the cell. And so this gets back to looking at depths. So in this case what happens is we shine light and in this case, we are, are shining uh, light of a particular wavelength that is going to be absorbed by a fluorophore. And once it is absorbed, the fluorophore is going to emit another wavelength of light. And we're going to detect that. And the main thing here is, right, we're talking about light is going to go through, and there's going to be a detector up here. All right. Along the way, all right, we use a bunch of lenses, so ultimately our eye is going to be up here. Is that an eyeball? Looks more like a sun. Um, but we're going to use a detector, and instead of collecting all of the light as it is refracted, all right, okay, there's a lens up here that's going to collect, collect it and send it, right, so at the angle, I'm not making, so this is a lens, and if it hits at this angle, it's going to bounce off at this angle. If it hits at this angle, it's going to bounce off at this angle. It's just like a pool table. All right. And what happens is we put another, um, uh, we put something in front of this, all right, in front of your eye that will only allow certain amount of light to uh, be collected. And so we can pinpoint it at a certain depth in the sample. And we call this, right, any out-of-focus emitted light is not collected, and that reduces interference. So confocal microscopy, by how it 
works does optical sectioning. Optical sectioning is shown here. All right, on the left, in this image right here, what you see is here's my cell that has depth. The, the, this is a lens right here. The gray is a lens. And that lens is going to collect light that's bouncing out of here. Now, the lens, all right, there's going to be light that's bouncing from down here, too. But when it bounces from down here, it might bounce out here. Some of it's going to bounce in here, all right? But some of it's not going to bounce in there. And then we also have light that's bouncing from here, all right? So from here, it could do this. But, all right, so what this lens does is it focuses th the light and it blocks out, all right? So how will I do blocking out? All right, maybe if I put... I don't know what color would be good for blocking out. Let's just say gray. Okay, so it blocks the rest of the light from reaching the detector. Up here is another feature of this, and we say that we have a very small pinhole, okay, that the light, this, this black thing, is also blocking out light. So depending on the, the, setup of the confocal microscope. So on the confocal, you set up a certain pinhole size, and it's usually very small, and we can focus the light where we want it. So light, notice here, light from the top can be sent out here, but if it hits anywhere on this part, right, other than where the pinhole is, all of this light is going to be thrown away. And you only get a little bit from the out-of-focus plane that is collected. This is a hard concept to understand. It's called optical sectioning because through optics, through lenses and prisms and detectors and pinholes, we have been able to sort of look at just a little slice in the cell. So organelles that were elsewhere, so an organelle up here or an organelle down here, those, the light that's being collected from those, a little tiny bit will reach the detector and will cause some interference. This is not perfect, but the vast majority of light is coming from this little slice of the cell and that's what's being collected and sent to the detector. I hope that makes sense. Here is a beautiful image showing the difference between collecting all the light, so this is collecting all the fluorescence that's emitted from a sample, and then on the right, so A is all the light, and B is doing the optical focusing and only allowing a certain amount of light in. So this is a confocal image. And I, I hope that you can grasp the difference here. We can really begin to see structure. We can see internally, so we can see inside here. You can see, right, there's a, uh, something green right there. I don't know what this is stained for in particular, um, but this is Drosophila. Do you know what Drosophila is? It's a fruit fly, and it's part of the gastrulation process in Drosophila. So this is looking at the embryo formation. And this is probably the invagination of the gastrula during uh, drosophila formation. We can really see structure now. So confocal microscopy gives us great resolution. So resolution is really good. All right, so we talked about just bright field, right? And we said there was bright field, well, there's phase contrast, there was DIC, contrast, DIC, uh, what was the uh, dark field? Okay, those are the simplest forms of microscopy. They don't usually use uh, high energy wavelengths, so they're, they're kind of cheap. The second one is confocal, and confocal gives us the ability to do really nice optical sectioning focal microscopy, and that's usually micro microscopy. That's hard to spell. 
And the last one here that I'm going to talk about, electron microscopy. Very expensive, very hard technique to, excuse me, to utilize, but gives excellent, excellent images as we've seen in class. Okay, very high energy wavelength, okay, high energy meant shorter wavelength, shorter wavelength, right, the shorter the wavelength, the greater the resolution. So this is short wavelength equals high resolution. And in this case, right, we're not actually sending a beam of light, but we're sending a beam of electrons. The electrons are sent at a sample, and we've talked about this numerous times in class. Electrons are tiny. They're going to be sent in a beam towards a sample. Here's our sample. And when they hit something in the sample, they may be deflected, and we have a detector on this side that can capture the deflected electrons. It's a hundred times better resolution than a regular light microscope. Okay? This is just showing us, right, the electrons are only going to hit the nuclei of cells. So you have to hit the protons plus the neutrons. You can't hit another electron. It just doesn't happen. Electrons don't hit electrons, or if they do, it's very minimally. And in all electron microscopy preparations, you're going to see that we stain samples with heavy metals. And the heavy metals are uranium and lead. These are toxic. These are radioactive. Not highly radioactive, but slightly radioactive. And so this technique is uh, a little more complicated. And another thing is samples must be fixed. What does that mean? Okay, it means, right, we're going to use glutaraldehyde or formaldehyde to fix the samples. We're going to cross-link them. The cells that we're going to look at are dead. They're not only dead, but they have to be processed in a certain way that allows for us to do this shooting of electrons at their nuclei of their atoms. Uh, there are two kinds of EM. There is transmission EM, TEM, and so that's the first kind of EM. And then there's a second kind of EM called SEM, scanning. Transmission scanning. And transmission EM, all of EM, requires that samples are treated in this way. So first off, samples are placed in a vacuum. And that is to remove all water. Okay. How do you feel about that? We're taking all the water out of cells. How much of the cell is water? At least 70% of the cell is water. And now we're going to take it all out and we're going to look at those cells. So right off the bat you should say, huh, hmm, I wonder if what we're really looking at is real. Okay, it's already artificial because we've taken all the water away. All right, second thing. Samples are stained with some sort of electron-dense material. That's the heavy metal that I just mentioned to you. Samples have to be taken uh, and cut into very, very, very thin slices because electrons can't travel very far. They can't penetrate a thick sample, a thick slice of skin. So they're sliced very, very thinly using a diamond tip. Uh something called a microtome. All right, and, and what you get from this, from these three treatments, are these incredibly beautiful images where dense regions, right, electron dense, electron dense, shows up as dark, electron lucent is light. This is a TEM of a cell, and I think you can really clearly appreciate the internal features of the cell. The nucleus is shown here, All right? This is the nucleus. Inside the nucleus is the nucleolus, and there's a lot of schmutz in here, okay? What else are you going to call this? 
This is all electron dense material. You can see there's tons of electron dense material. The nucleolus is incredibly electron dense. And what do you know about the nucleolus? The nucleolus has rRNA and ribonuclear proteins. It's filled with proteins, okay? And so in this, it really shows you that the nucleolus is, it's a ton of ribosomes all waiting to be exported out. You can see that there are other organelles in the cell that they're pointing to. Um, th there's a bunch of vacuoles. That kind of tells you what cell this is. If there's vacuoles, it's a plant cell. You might have gotten the plant cell because of the cell wall. All right. There are plastids. What is a plastid? So plastids, there are multiple kinds of plastids, but the plastid that you most know about is a chloroplast. And that's important for photosynthesis. All right, tiny little Golgi apparatus over here. If I were to make this bigger, okay, I don't know if this is going to work. Actually, it is. That's beautiful. Oh, wow. I'm really... I hope that what you can see is there are multiple membranes there. One, two, three, four. And my pen is too fat. So that is actually a Golgi. All right, if I zoom back out. This is just beautiful. All right. What else can you see in this cell? You should be able to find another organelle that we know and love. Anybody? Where is it? If I make it smaller. Okay, so over here on the right side they show a mitochondria. This, all right, it's, it's actually hard to see this. Uh, I don't know that I would have picked that out as a mitochondria. Hard to tell. All right, can't see the internal membranes. This is not maybe the best EM picture I've ever seen, but it is an EM picture. It is beautiful. I actually think this is a mitochondria. Uh, once again, I'm back. Uh, this might be a mitochondria. If I were to zoom way out, actually, and then look down here. This right here also looks like a mitochondria. And if we zoom in on that one, let's just see. That one, as soon as we blow it up, we're losing resolution here. Um, we're at very low, right, very small molecules. A whole cell might only be 10 microns across, and, and this is just one tiny part of a cell. It, it does look somewhat better um, when you do not blow it up as much, but clearly this is allowing us to see a slice through the cell. So transmission, if I just put this up here for a second, Okay, so TEM takes a slice and we look at inside the cell. That is going to be very different than the SEM that we're going to see just in one second. So SEM scanning electron microscopy shows the outside of a sample. And sometimes these are the most beautiful pictures ever. What they do is they take their, their samples, so here's a slide, has a bunch of cells or whatever on it, and they spray, all right, they take like a spray bottle. Ooh, how will I draw that? You know, I guys, I can't draw. But here they spray the outside with the heavy metals, and now what happens is you get this three-dimensional image of the outer surface of this. So... It's a little bit different because we know, okay, heavy metals are going to coat this, okay? If these are heavy metals, right, you're going to get all the proteins on the outside are going to bind heavy metals. Now, when the electron beam is sent at the sample, you get scattering, and there's a detector out here. So, in this case, the electrons are coming from the top, the scatter is collected on the side, and you can see the outside coating of a cell. I find, I just... This is an incredibly beautiful image. So this on the left-hand side is the SEM. Hold on. Okay, I'm back. This is the SEM, and what you can see, this is stereocilia from a hair cell in the inner ear of a bullfrog. What the heck does all that mean? Our, our hearing is based on these tiny, tiny, tiny cilia in ears that... As sound waves, right, a sound is a wave as well. Oops, sorry about that. As a sound wave hits these, it causes them to move, and that's what we register as sound. 
And so this is the SEM. You can really see the beautiful outside of this image. It's comparing it to a DIC image. So the DIC is up here on the top right. And I mean, DIC is not bad. And, and DIC, right, digital interference contrast, gives you a little bit of a 3D structural uh, look at this, this particular um, feature. And a transmission electron microscope, remember, is cutting through this. And so we're actually seeing the inner part of each stereocilia and how they're attached on this membrane. So SEM has a place, D TEM has a place, DIC has a place. Everything will be used where it's necessary to get a particular type of information about any kind of cell. So let's talk a little bit just quickly about limitations. The main limitation, I think I already said it for EM, okay, is number one, you have to remove water. And are we looking? So we're removing water. And now what are you looking at? I, I, I really don't know. What are we looking at? We're looking at some dehydrated thing. Have you ever eaten dehydrated food? Does it taste like real food? No. So what are we looking at? That's one thing. And then we also have to right, fix the samples. So in EM, everything is dead. It's fixed. Dead. D-E-A-D, sorry. Fixed, which means nothing is able to move. And that's not real either. But these are the best methods we have today to look at at structures and cells. So I hope this helps you out with the information for class as well as for other classes and that's going to be it. There's another one. Okay, so I do believe that's the end of this lecture. I will get this posted and then I will also get um, a quiz up for you guys for this information and you'll have two chances to do it and that's it. Bye!